I guess we're going to get going here. We're a couple minutes in. Uh, if anyone else, uh, if anyone else is uh, showing up late, they can uh, they can play catch up a little bit. Uh, as we always ask folks, I'll ask everyone uh, to keep their microphones off and their video streams turned off. Um, that's because we try to avoid those video streams being recorded as part of the overall presentation. It's just a little bit distracting uh, to have uh, multiple video windows up there. Uh, Dave Brown is kindly curating the chat for us tonight. Uh, so uh, any questions that come up, uh, please throw them into chat and Dave will uh, Dave will cue those up to be asked at uh, either various intervals throughout the talk or uh, at the end. Um, yeah. Tonight, oh, I'm on the wrong screen now. Tonight, uh, we're talking about head injuries and concussions. Um, we're doing a little bit more anatomy physiology than we normally do, uh, and a little bit less management. The reason for that is the management is actually quite simple. You take them to the hospital to see a physician and possibly have their head uh, CT'd. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit, uh, a little bit moving forward. Uh, for those of you guys who don't uh, who don't know me, I think a lot of you do know me already. But for those of you who don't, my name is Nick Hume. I'm a paramedic in uh, in British Columbia, working for uh, BC Emergency Health Services. I also uh, I also am a provincial staff officer at St. John Ambulance, and somehow I'm attached to the training department here in Victoria. Um, I uh, I am a primary care paramedic. I have an undergraduate degree uh, on the piece of paper. It says social sciences, but in fact, I studied anthropology and more specifically, I studied physical anthropology and human skeletal forensics and structures. So, and I actually specialized in the human skull. So this is uh, to some extent an area of specialization for myself. I am by no means an expert in this field, um, but, uh, but this is an area that I've, I've dedicated a, a significant amount of time uh, studying and learning about. Um, this will give, especially uh, especially people who have been doing first aid or pre-hospital healthcare for a long time, uh, this should give you a, a, a bit of a chuckle. Does everyone remember when, uh, you know, back in the 90s, even for people who'd like, like cut their finger, you had to try and spinally immobilize them basically, or it felt like that at least. Um, this always makes me think of that. <clears throat> um, so, we're going to talk about a few things, guys, tonight. Uh, we're going to talk about what is a head injury. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, cranial anatomy. We're going to talk about uh, major head injuries. We're going to talk about skull injuries, or skull fractures and injuries, brain injuries. We're going to talk about intracranial bleeds. We're going to talk about how to assess this stuff in a meaningful way. And your assessment is actually one of the, the most valuable things that you can add to uh, a head injury call that you might do because it helps set a baseline for a uh, for clinicians and practitioners later. Uh, and we're gonna talk about how to manage things. I've already sort of given you some spoilers in that as we move forward. Um, so what is a head injury? What actually constitutes a head injury? Well, um, contrary to what many people think when we, when we talk about head injuries in healthcare, we're specifically talking about major head injuries or, or injuries that impact, um, that impact the skull or the brain, really. So we do uh, we do often have some folks who will conflate or confuse a laceration or a soft, a soft tissue injury, which is an injury to the head, with what we might otherwise be talking about as a head injury. Now, we're going to talk about this very briefly. A laceration or soft tissue uh, injury to the, the tissue of the head um, is probably the most common type of head injury we see on St. John Dewey's again. Does it involve the word head and the word injury? Yes. Is it what we're normally trying to talk about? Uh, when we talk about head injuries, uh, not really. Um, laceration soft tissue injuries, treat them as any other soft tissue injury, direct pressure for the bleeds, uh, dress, bandage, transport if necessary, so if they need sutures or, uh, or, or anything else. Um, broadly speaking, uh, isolated lacerations to the head uh, are probably not life-threatening. They could certainly be life-altering if they were severe enough. Uh, they could conceivably lead to an exsanguination or a blood loss event, um, especially in children and for infants who have very, uh, or people have impaired clotting. So people have very low volumes of blood, um, people who are predisposed to not clot properly. Um, one of the big things we want to walk away from is with lacerations and soft tissue injuries of the head, 
um, do assess the mechanism. Are there C-spine concerns? If an elderly person on blood thinners has walked underneath a tree, scratched their head on a branch, and is now bleeding profusely from a one or two or three or four inch laceration on their head, uh, do we need to worry about C-spine concerns? Probably not. If that same person has fallen and hit their head on a concrete curb, absolutely. That should be something that should be going into the part of our decision-making matrix. Um, do please remember, um, and I can't, I feel like this is an SMBC comic, by the way. I feel like this is from Saturday Morning Breakfast Zero, um, but I, uh, I'm not sure. I don't have an attribution for it. Uh, please don't use tourniquets. Um, so when we start talking about uh, what head injuries are, and we talk, start talking about true head injuries, and I'm using sort of air quotes here, um, one of the first types we, we want to think about are skull fractures. So fractures of the skull, the skull is obviously the bony structure that provides form and protection to the head. Um, skull fractures are less commonly seen than St. John Andone studies. We don't see a huge number of these. Have we seen them here in Victoria? Absolutely, on multiple occasions. Um, are they as common as people who have got a soft tissue injury? Not even close. Um, Skull fractures generally, but not always, and this is a really important takeaway. We're going to talk about why this is the case later. Generally, but not always, require higher energy mechanisms. So they need more energy in to cause more damage. Um, skull fractures are more common in elderly or osteologically or bone compromised individuals. So people with osteoporosis, people with congenital defects like osteogenesis imperfecta, um, people who, uh, um, yeah, people who have compromised bone structures for whatever reason. Um, the second type of, of head injury that we, uh, th that we want to talk about are concussions. Uh, concussions are the most common form of a traumatic brain injury. We're going to go into a bit of a deep dive about this later on. Uh, they can vary in severity from minor to severe. Um, minor concussions are, as the name implies, generally speaking, quite minor. Um, they may be very short-lived. They may not have many long-term sequelae. Severe concussions, uh, it's difficult to emphasize how life-changing a severe concussion can be to someone. Um, uh, severe concussions can be, can be life-altering and impact people's ability to think, ability to process the world around them, ability to remember things um, for months or years or the rest of their life potentially. So don't underestimate how, how significant those can be. Um, a concussion is loosely defined as being a head injury with a temporary loss or impairment of brain function. Um, that's a very broad definition. Again, we're gonna talk more about some specifics of that later on. Um, a lot of literature now refers to mild traumatic brain injury or MTBI instead. Uh, we're gonna use the word concussion for most of tonight, but if you do see that terminology around, just know that it's, it's generally speaking referring to the same thing with maybe a couple of nuanced differences. Um, and talk about uh, a little bit about intracranial bleeds as well. Uh, they're often, or they're very common um, secondary events to other head injuries. Um, they can happen spontaneously, uh, but, uh, but they're one of our major concerns with someone who's got a head injury, so we're gonna talk about them tonight as well. Um, an intracranial bleed is um, a, a bleeding vein or artery inside the calvarium. We're gonna learn what the calvarium is in a moment as well. And they can be spontaneous. Uh, about 15% of strokes, 1-5% of strokes, are hemorrhagic strokes, which means they're bleeding strokes. When a blood vessel has, for whatever reason, ruptured uh, inside the head. Or, uh, or intracranial bleeds can be the result of trauma um, and, uh, and the result of, uh, of uh, either direct or indirect trauma that's ruptured a blood vessel internal to the head as well. So we're going to talk about cranial anatomy, bones, brains, and blood. Um, this should be, to some extent, review for some of you guys. Some of this will be new. Some of this should be familiar material. Um, the skull, the skull, the human skull. We're talking about humans here, by the way. I don't always say human every time, but we are talking about humans throughout this talk. Uh, it is comprised of roughly 22 bones joined at, joined at synarthroidal or immovable joints, commonly called sutures. So we'll see in, on a slide in a second that the plates of the skull intermesh and interlink. And so your skull is made up of many, many, many bones, but they're joined together so, so, so tightly. You could think of this as being comparable to woodwork joinery um, or, or something like that. 
um, where the bones have knit together during development uh, and during the aging process and have effectively uh, started acting as one bone. Um, some bones, some bones are very thick, some bones are very strong. Some bones in your skull are thinner than a piece of paper. So the lacrimal bone uh, has an average thickness of 0.1 millimeters. If you shine, if you ever have the opportunity to hold a real human skull in your hands for, for, uh, for whatever reason, um, I, I was lucky enough to, to have access to a lot of those, uh, again, going through university. Um, or have opportunities to do that a lot if you're going to university. Um, but the lacrimal bone is one of the very small bones inside the orbit of the eye, and you can actually shine a piece of a light through it, and it's thinner than a piece of paper by a fairly wide margin. So when we talk about skull, uh, a lot of people don't necessarily know the difference between skull, cranium, calvarium, uh, and all these sorts of fancy terms. So this is the skull. The skull is the bones of the head, all of the bones of the head, including the mandible, uh, which I have spelled incorrectly on this slide. It normally has a B in it, um, uh, which is the jawbone. Next up is the cranium. And people do often tr use the term cranium and mandible. Uh, I have spelled mandible correctly on this slide. People often conflate or confuse the terms cranium and mandible. The cranium is the skull minus the mandible. Um, so if the mandible has been removed or detached, or we're just talking about the cranium. This is what we're talking about. You can see it highlighted in red here. The calvarium uh, is the cranium minus the facial bones because the face sort of forms its own uh, fairly unique and specific structure. Um, we talk about the calvarium as being the cranial vault or the, uh, the, the vault in which the brain is housed. Um, but we, we often talk about that in the absence of discussing the facial bones. And as you guys can see on these slides as well here, um, going back to the, the, the cranium calvarium slides here, you can see some of the sutures, which are all named. Everything, uh, as with anything in anatomy, everything has a name. Um, but um, you can see the squamosal suture. I want you guys to pay particular attention to the temporal region, sort of like right smack in the middle of the slide. Remember where that is, because we're going to come back and talk about the temporal region and why it's particularly important to pre-hospital healthcare. Um, later on. So uh, this, uh, there is a quiz. You're expected to have these terms memorized by the end of the talk tonight. No, please don't. Um, but uh, we do talk about the basal skull as well. Um, the basal skull is sort of the, the flat bottom of the uh, sphere, a spheroid-like thing. That is the uh, that is the skull. So when we talk about basal or skull fractures. Is actually a very clearly delineated um, area that basal or skull fractures are part of, um, uh, which we're seeing here. I'm not going to go too far down the rabbit hole going into this stuff, but um, the basal or skull is normally regarded as the occipital, temporal, sphenoid, and ethmoid bones, right? We're talking about other bones, parts of the facial structure and stuff, if they're not on that list. We're not normally talking about them as basal or skull fractures. Um, in terms of terminology, just for, for, for your guys' benefit, uh, the word foramen, uh, uh, or the plural is foramen I, is a hole somewhere in a bone or a structure. Um, the, the foramen magnum, if you guys look in the middle of the image on your left here, you'll see the foramen magnum. That's the big hole in the bottom of the skull through which the brainstem and the spinal cord pass. And you'll see a, a number of other foramens uh, labeled on here as well. Um, a process is an appendage outgrowth or a protuberance, a uh, structure that sticks out a bit and is worth giving a name to. So uh, I don't think we have any processes labeled on these. Oh yeah, here we go. Off on the right hand side there, you'll see the mastoid and the styloid and the um, uh, process. The mastoid process is uh, the biggest process uh, in the skull, I think. Pretty sure it is. It's located right behind the ear. So if you feel behind your ear, you'll feel like a really big, heavy, bony thing. That's your mastoid process. Um, in terms of uh, uh, sutures, uh, again, please don't feel compelled to uh, sutures and foramen and other features. Please don't feel compelled to memorize all of these. Um, but as you can see, that the skull is a very, very complex, bony structure. And what I'm trying to get across to everyone today is how complex it actually is. Uh, certainly, um, certainly there's wide variation throughout the skull in terms of its strength and or fragility. Um, 
Some parts of the skull are particularly robust. Uh, some parts of the, uh, of the skull are particularly fragile. And, uh, and again, we're going to get into a little bit of that later on. Um, remember me talking about the lacrimal bone earlier. If you guys look on the right hand side here, one, two, three, four down, you'll see the lacrimal bone uh, labeled inside the orbit of what we're seeing as the right orbit um, of this particular skull. Uh, you'll also notice the zygomatic process, and it's difficult to show you guys this uh, with a, like a 3D model or something, but that zygomatic process is uh, what we often think of as a cheekbone. So that's actually what's uh, what's running back here. And there are muscles that run both underneath and over top of the zygomatic process, the zygomatic arch. Um, this is just a front view of the same um, with more sutures and uh, bones and, and everything labeled just from a different perspective. Uh, you'll notice uh, uh, you'll notice a few foramen labeled, uh, the infraorbital foramen, the mental foramen um, in the mandible. Uh, so those foramen going into bones are how the bones are innervated and provided with blood supply. Uh, uh, so those actually have blood vessels and nerves passing through them and into the bone to provide the blood supply for the rest of the bone. Um, I'd like you guys to pay attention as well uh, on the frontal bone here, um, just above the eyes. So on the top right hand side here, you'll see the frontal bone and the supraorbital foramen labeled. Um, the frontal bone uh, comprises or is the bone that, that comprises your eyebrows and your forehead basically. It's one of the, uh, it's probably the strongest bone I think uh, in the human skull. It's one of the strongest bones in your, uh, in your body. Um, foramen, uh, Mike's sending us. Also, Dave, I'm getting people messaging me asking to be let in from the waiting room if you're able to. Um, yeah, we're going to talk about the frontal bone versus the lacrimal bone uh, uh, as we move forward here. So moving on, um, this is a posterior view, view from behind. So we're seeing the occipital bone, the back of the head, the lower back of the head. We're seeing the back side of the mandible. We're seeing the left and right parietal bones um, and the temporal bones, of course, as well with the, the mastoid process again, visible from the posterior. Um, again, similar thing just from the bottom. Uh, these slides are in here to give folks reference and something to pause on uh, if they're watching this on YouTube later, but uh, I'm not going to I'm not going to keep yammering at you guys here as we move forward. So we had lots of things labeled here. I said earlier that there are 22 bones uh, in the human skull. Uh, those are the frontal, two parietals, uh, the occipital, two temporals, a sphenoid, an ethmoid, two nasals, two maxillae, two lacrimal bones, two zygomas, two palatine bones, two nasal concha, uh, a vomer, it's my favorite name for all, all the bones in the human body, the vomer and the mandible. Uh, and there's additionally three ear ossicles. Those are the bones, the tiny little bones in the, uh, the inner ear as well. And the hyoid, which is uh, of course lending structure to uh, um, a lot of the soft tissue in the throat. A uh, little humor break for you guys. This is uh, high flow oxygen when an NRB isn't enough. Um, the kid really looks like he, he or she is having fun here. I don't know what to tell you. Please don't do this to your patients. Uh, this, this makes me think of pulmonary, uh, pulmonary trauma when I see this. Um, so a few considerations, uh, as always, as with anything in pre-hospital medicine or medicine in general, uh, kids are different, kids are special. Um, children have softer skulls than adults. Their bones have not fully hardened. Of course, when we're born or when we're very young, uh, large portions of our bone are soft. They're not fully calcified. They're almost cartilaginous. Um, and then they slowly develop into hardened bony structures as we age. Uh, there's a bunch of complex reasons for that. One of them is that things that bend fit through birth canals way better than things that don't bend. Um, the end result of that is that kids have not fully calcified skulls. The younger the kid, the less calcified the skull. Um, that makes them softer. Children's heads are larger. As we know from some of our airway talks, children's heads are much larger relative to their body size, not absolutely larger, obviously. Um, that gives much greater momentum and potential for C-spine injury. Anybody who's ever held a baby knows that you have to support the baby's head because even at rest, you can cause the baby injury just from the weight of their own head not being supported and hanging off to one side. 
Um, outright skull fracture is less common in children. That's due to a couple of things. Uh, one reason for that is that kids are less likely to be exposed to mechanisms capable of fracturing skulls. Uh, the other reason for that is that the kids, as we've mentioned, have less uh, calcified and less rigid and therefore less brittle bony structures. So because, uh, because their head is softer and, and less calcified, it's more likely to, um, it's more likely to deform um, sorry, I, aplastically deform um, rather than actual fracture, rather than actually fracture, pardon me. You could compare this to uh, like something made out of rubber versus, uh, versus an egg fracturing. You push on a rubber ball and it'll bounce back into shape. You push on an egg, you push hard enough, the eggshell fractures and breaks. Same idea. Um, there's greater potential for damage to underlying structures. So because kids, uh, because kids are uh, you know, have these uh, have these softer skulls. Those softer skulls do a, a less good job of providing protection to the underlying structures, the blood vessels, the brain. Um, so there is greater potential for damage to underlying structures. Um, infants, I think most of you guys, we do cover this in the MFR for those of you who've done it. Um, infants do have fontanelles. Fontanelles are when we talked earlier about how bones knit together and form those sutures. Fontanelles are uh, areas of incomplete sutural fusion between the bones of the skull. So this is an illustration of fontanelles. If you're holding a very young infant, you can find the soft spot in their head. Uh, you can poke it. Please don't poke the soft spot in the baby's head. It's probably not going to hurt them, but it's probably not great for them either. Um, but if you do find uh, those soft spots, it doesn't mean they have uh, they have a depressed skull fracture necessarily. Uh, that is a normal anatomical feature for infants up to uh, really I call eight, I think at eighteen months. I think I should be able to remember that age, but I can't right now. Um, anatomy and functional areas of the brain. Um, this is not. We're not going to go super in depth. This is again sort of just here for reference. Um, some of the uh, some of the uh, some of the reasons that this is of particular interest to us tonight is that uh, is that obviously uh, areas of the brain that are injured or impacted by external trauma. Um, you know, if an area of the brain responsible for uh, for uh, speech, for example, Broca's area. Um, it is directly injured. The person who has sustained that injury is going to struggle more with, uh, uh, with their capacity to, to speak and to use their muscles of speaking. So this just sort of gives you some, some basic landmarks. Um, for those of you who might not know this already, uh, the brain stem, so at the bottom of the brain, this is a bit more obvious on the right hand side here, um, the brain stem and the cerebellum, those are the areas of the brain, uh, they're, they're sort of the, the simple brain, some people call them the lizard brain. They're the areas of the brain that, that focus primarily on physiological function. They're the most well-protected areas of the brain, mostly or kind of. Um, but if we have, uh, or if we sustain injury to the brain stem or the cerebellum, those are areas that, uh, um, that can be particularly problematic because those are areas where people will have physiologically life-threatening injuries if that area of the brain is impacted. Um, I, again, this I, I suspect this is review for a lot of folks, but uh, the layers of the skull and the meninges, uh, the, the skull has many, many layers to it. Um, obviously, the outer one is skin. You could argue the outer one is hair, even to some extent. Um, uh, in from that is the periosteum, the, uh, the membrane that covers uh, bone, the cranium, uh, the cranial bones themselves. And then a couple of layers uh, of, of different membranes underneath the bone and before the brain, uh, or before the brain when we're talking about the calvarium at least. Um, the dura mater, the arachnoid mater, and the pia mater. And uh, uh, we will talk a lot or a fair bit more about those as we move forward as well, because when there are bleeds inside the brain, where those bleeds happen and in between which layers of the skull those bleeds can happen, can have a really, really significant impact on our uh, uh, on our patient's clinical course. Um, more skull and injuries. This is just a different uh, different view showing largely the same thing. You can see the hair on the scalp, the periosteum, the bone. Um, you can see the dura mater, 
uh, the arachnoid mater, the pia mater, you can see where blood vessels uh, uh, in between the, uh, um, uh, sorry, under the, or in the subarachnoid space. Um, and I think that's, those are sort of the highlights there. Um, vascular structures of the, the endocranium. So these are the blood vessels that run around the outside of your brain and on the inside of your skull. And uh, th this slide has one big takeaway for you guys that I want you to pay attention to, and that's the location of the middle meningeal artery and the temporal and the sphenoid bones. So where that temporal suture is in between the temporal and the sphenoid bones and where the middle meningeal artery is. Um, again, things we're going to come back and talk about in a few moments. So now we know all about the skull. You guys are ready for your test. You guys are going to, uh, uh, you guys are going to have all of these terms memorized. I'm getting a, a pronunciation correction from someone, um, from Mike. Uh, I have, I, it's funny because Mike, I was actually corrected in the opposite direction when I was studying this stuff. Um, and so I, <laughs> I don't know what to tell you. Um, so uh, in terms of, uh, yeah, that's true. Um, in terms of buttressing and, or in terms of skull fractures, pardon me, uh, we talk about buttressing and crumpling. So uh, the skull, as we talked about, is a complex structure that has both robust and delicate or fragile features. So some areas of the skull are very, very, very tough. Some of them, uh, you, you can almost break them by looking at them. Um, the robust features uh, of the skull are often strong due to buttressing and or increased thickness. So areas like the frontal bone, uh, the mastoid process behind the ears, um, the occipital bone around the base of the skull and the bones of the base of the skull. Um, many structures, uh, um, many structures of the skull, especially the face, act in the same way that automotive crumple zones do. So when, uh, when someone gets hit in the face very, very hard, for example, um, all of those crumple zones, all of your sinuses, all of those complex structures will actually compress in the same way the front bumper of your car uh, um, might compress um, and reduce some of the energy that's being transmitted to the, uh, to the deeper structures inside the skull, like the brain itself. I mean, so skull, skull fractures generally fall into one or several of the following groupings. Uh, fractures of the base of the skull, uh, often called basilar skull fractures, basilar skull fractures. Um, linear fractures, so linear fractures, as the name suggests, are just sort of straight line fractures. Um, fractures of the calvarium, uh, so open vault fractures are when the vault of the calvarium, the actual, um, the vault being the, the space inside, has been fractured and is open, uh, and the brain or, or the, other, uh, um, the other structures uh, inside the vault are exposed to the outside world or depressed skull fractures, uh, depressed fractures. Depressed skull fractures, again, as the name suggests, are where, uh, are where a chunk or a piece of one of the bones of the calvarium has been pressed into the underlying structure. Depressed fractures are, uh, uh, we don't see them very often, um, but they are generally uh, uh, quite severe because of the amount of damage they do to the underlying structures, notably the brain and the vasculature. Uh, in terms of uh, or going back to some of my, my previous uh, um, academic education in this field, generally speaking, we would regard a depressed skull fracture of, I think it was, I want to say it was like one, was around one centimeter, 10 millimeters in that neighborhood. There was an actual number attached to this that I'm now failing to remember. Um, but uh, if, if you found uh, um, in an archaeological context or a forensic context, a uh, um, a skull uh, uh, a skull with a depressed fracture like that, uh, you'd normally assume that that injury was consistent with the end of that individual's life. Um, very few exceptions to that. Um, there are exceptions, obviously, but um, you have to pardon me for a second here. I'm going to have to say yes to a work shift here. I'm going. This is bad manners, but. Uh, I apologize, guys. Um, so uh, in terms of other fractures, fractures of the facial bones, um, we can have Lefort fractures, orbital fractures, and other fractures. Uh, we're going to talk about orbital and Lefort fractures and what those are uh, in the next couple of slides here. 
Um, basilar skull fractures are a clear indicator of a significant mechanism. So basilar skull fractures or basal skull fractures, injuries to that basal skull, um, that's a very, very strong structure. Basilar skull fractures require a lot of energy, a lot. Um, basal skull fractures do require uh, presumptive C-spine immobilization. I, I don't know how on earth you would diagnose a basal or skull fracture in the field, but if for some reason that you're, you're concerned about it, I can't imagine a basal or skull fracture that wouldn't also require presumptive C-spine immobilization. Um, they do carry a, a fairly high likelihood of clinical deterioration of the patient. Injuries that are sustained uh, after the impartation of this much energy or enough energy to, to fracture the basal or skull uh, is, is likely to have caused significant damage to the underlying structures as well. Um, basal or skull fractures, because they are in the basal skull, are no, located near the cerebellum, in the medulla oblongata, the regions of the brain that control basic body functions like posture, gross motor control, and respiratory drive. So basilar skull fractures, A, require a lot of energy, and B, happen immediately beside the chunks of your brain that make you do things like breathe um, and, and have a, a effective circulation and respiratory drive and control your gross motor function. So very, very serious injuries, generally speaking. Uh, fractures of the calvarium. Uh, we talked a little bit about depressed versus non-depressed skull fractures uh, already. Uh, complications of fractures of the calvarium can include rupture of the meninges leading to infection. So if, if those meninges are ruptured, um, you can have a route for pathogens to travel from the outside world into the brain itself, causing infection. Uh, rupture of the blood vessels, I would say, in the pre-hospital world, in terms of what you or I will be dealing with, rupture of the blood vessels uh, or in, in patients with a fracture of the calvarium, rupture of the blood vessels is going to be the immediate concern. Um, you can let the neurologist worry about the infection stuff later on, but, um, but uh, ruptured blood vessels and increased intracranial pressure will be, uh, will be the things that you need to worry about the most uh, in a pre-hospital environment. Um, fractures of the calvarium may be depressed and impinged directly on meninges uh, or brain matter, uh, potentially resulting in loss of cerebrospinal fluid, direct brain trauma, all that sort of, uh, all that sort of horrible, horrible stuff. Um, this is, uh, this appears to be um, one CT scan slice of a, uh, um, of a depressed fracture of the calvarium. I don't know about the circumstances under which this, uh, this image was required. Uh, Mike, who has uh, a, an extensive background in, in nuclear imaging, is saying, ow. Uh, I, I think it would be reasonable to assume that this was probably a life-ending injury for this individual. Perhaps not. Certainly life-altering um, either way. Um, always get a second opinion. Always, always, always get a second opinion. Um, I do quite, uh, I do get a kick out of this. I clearly uh, grabbed this image from uh, cartoonstock.com as well. Uh, this, the slides, a lot of the slides in this presentation, by the way, guys, are uh, um, being reused from uh, the last time I presented this about, uh, about uh, four years ago, three years ago or so. So I don't recall exactly where all this came from. So facial fractures, common facial fractures. Uh, I think one of the more common facial fractures that we see are orbital blowout fractures. Um, we're going to talk about those in a sec, Lefort fractures uh, and fractures of the zygoma. Um, so orbital blow fractures, as you might assume uh, from the name, orbital blow fractures are fractures of the orbit or the bony structures of the orbit of the eye. Uh, they often or generally speaking happen when uh, um, some external force compresses and deforms the eyeball and that deformation then causes a fracture of one of the very thin bones that forms the orbit of the eye itself. Again, the lacrimal bone, the nasal bones are, are sort of uh, chief contenders here. Again, remember that some of the bones in the orbit of the eye are 0.1 millimeters, one tenth of a millimeter thick. Um, it is not difficult to do this. Things to look for in terms of orbital blow fractures, someone who sustained eye trauma and is not able to look in one particular direction, left or right, or they have fixed gaze in one direction, left or right, um, it, it can be a very obvious and very telltale sign that that, that person might have suffered normal blow fracture. 
Um, Lafort fractures are basically fractures of the face. You guys can see on this slide, uh, there's three grades of Lafort fractures, Lafort one, two, and three. Um, if, uh, if someone has sustained significant enough facial trauma to fracture, Lafort fractures uh, tend to fracture along very characteristic lines. So Lafort fractures are by definition fractures along these, uh, these uh, the red lines, uh, the pink highlighted and the red lines on the slide. Um, the reason Lafort fractures happen along those lines is because those happen to be the, um, the, the places where stress or, or kinetic energy will accumulate and or the bony structures are the weakest. And so these are places that the skulls tend to, uh, or the human skulls tend to fracture in when they are exposed to significant enough energy. Um, as you can tell, it is actually possible to literally break someone's face off the rest of their skull. Um, I hope this never happens to any one of you, and I hope this never happens to any one of your patients. Um, uh, again, Lafort 1, 2, and 3 fractures, uh, true Lafort fractures are not especially common things for us to see on St. John duties, and they are indicative of fairly high mechanism or high energy mechanisms. Um, if for some reason you're seeing something that looks like a Lafort fracture, you think that you're seeing a Lafort fracture, you should assume that significant energy was imparted to the individual who sustained that injury. Go looking for everything else that's wrong with them as well. Um, other concerns with skull fractures, um, trauma to the temporal region. Remember uh, we had a few slides back, we talked about the, uh, about the temporal region um, and uh, carry-on uh, is one of the sutral, uh, sutral conjunctions in that region. Um, but the middle meningeal artery, I don't know if you guys can see or not, that runs up and down uh, underneath the temporal region. The temporal region uh, is not especially thick, and it has a significant artery that runs directly underneath it. So direct trauma to the temporal region, especially direct trauma that, that either fractures the bone in that region or causes any kind of deformity, can actually rupture that artery and cause bleeding inside the brain. Um, or inside the calvarium, pardon me, um, uh, which can obviously be very, uh, very, very severe. Um, other things to worry about or other things to be aware of, a direct facial trauma, especially in an upwards direction, can displace the crystagalli. And I wish I'd pointed this out on one of the earlier slides, guys, but um, the crystagalli is a structure inside the calvarium that extends through some of the sinus bones. And, a, and direct facial trauma um, can potentially displace the crista galli superiorly, resulting in direct brain trauma. If you've ever seen the, uh, like I'm thinking, I think this actually happens in a Steven Seagal movie from like 1993 or something, where, you, you know, the martial arts guy punches the guy in the face the right way, and uh, and of course immediately kills him, it's uh, ostensibly because they've, they've done this and displaced that bony structure into the brain. Um, have I ever seen one? No. Are they especially common injuries? No. Um, do you remember uh, the injuries we're talking about here are a, a fairly brief primer to skull trauma. Uh, we could probably do a couple of university level courses on this and, and really just scratch the surface. Uh, the take home point that I want everyone to have when they walk away from this is that there's a lot that can go wrong with the skull and the, the human skull is a very, very, very complex part of the human body. It is the most complex bone that we know of. Um, uh, and it is, uh, there, there's, there's a fantastic amount, a fantastic variety of different ways that, uh, that the skull can have significant injury. Uh, this should, I hope, make someone laugh. Anyone who was born in the 90s? Nothing, no one. You guys are quiet tonight. Um, so we're gonna talk about brain injuries. We're gonna talk about, uh, we're talking about, uh, talk about, we've talked a lot about skull injuries. We're gonna talk about brain injuries a little bit. So there's a few varieties of, or categories of brain injuries. We talk about moderate traumatic brain injuries, concussions. Uh, we can talk about diffuse axonal injuries. Uh, we can talk about focal brain injuries. We can talk about intracranial bleeding. Uh, we've already sort of brushed on that a little bit. Um, I, I've seen some literature that suggests uh, some degree of disagreement about whether intracranial bleeding constitutes a true brain injury or uh, um, uh, and uh, it's close enough for our purpose. We're going to talk about it tonight. So um, MTBIs and DIIs. So uh, 
the results of uh, mild and moderate uh, MTBI and or that bullet point was poorly worded, guys. I'm sorry. Um, so a, a mild traumatic brain injury and moderate traumatic brain injury um, uh, or a diffuse axonal injury result in diffuse tissue damage ranging from micro bleeding, so, uh, so small bleeding, small hemorrhages uh, throughout the brain structure and brain contusion or bruising. So uh, as you guys know, vasculature goes from, uh, from large arteries to small arteries. Um, down to capillary beds and then sort of you know, goes back up in, in terms of the venous structures that, that return blood to the heart. Um, what we can see is uh, when the brain sustains broad uh, diffuse uh, energy or impact to it, um, what we'll see is we'll see uh, microbleeding or petechial hemorrhage um, from those capillary bed structures and from the very smallest arterial and venous structures, um, causing little micro bleeds everywhere, um, potentially causing bruising as well. Um, MTBIs and DIAs are generally associated with diffuse neurological symptoms. So things like uh, confusion, general confusion. I don't know where I am. Who are you? What's going on? Uh, decreased or altered level of consciousness, unconsciousness. Uh, death. Death is always on the symptom list for almost everything, it seems like. Um, I hope that made sense. It was a little bit of a disjointed slide. I hope that made sense. Um, focal brain injuries are more uh, if a brain injury is limited to a specific area. It can be regarded as a focal brain injury. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with a guy named Phineas Gage, Phineas Gage spelled P-H-I-N-E-A-S, uh, last name Gage, G-A-G-E, P-H-I-N-E-A-S, Gage, G-A-G-E. Phineas Gage was a, a guy who had a chunk of rebar. Um, had a, he was working on a railroad and he had a, a mishap in a chunk, I think it was rebar or something, passed through his jaw, uh, through his frontal lobe of his brain and then out the top. And, and Phineas, this is back in the 1800s, and Phineas uh, miraculously uh, survived this injury but suffered a, a great many um, focal uh, neurologic sequelae, uh, specifically around his behavior patterns, because his entire frontal lobe had, or large portions of his frontal lobe, had effectively been obliterated by his injury. Um, but he didn't have any changes in his uh, in his speech patterns, in his, uh, well, I'm not sure about vision, to be honest, certainly in his motor function, things like that. Uh, Relatively well-known case study. You can probably Google them and, and learn quite a bit. Um, neurologic deficits will be dependent on the area of the brain that's injured. Um, as with anything, if you injure the part of the brain that, that focuses on vision and sight and visual processing and the visual cortex, um, if, you, if you injure that part of the brain, your vision will be impaired. If you injure the part of the brain that deals with um, speech, speech will be impaired. Uh, this is uh, more of a key concept when we start talking about strokes than it is uh, sort of traumatic stuff, but it does still apply to the traumatic stuff. Uh, quick anatomy refresher. <clears throat> talking about the different layers of the skull or the different areas and layers of the skull. Um, I'm not going to rehash all of this, but uh, I, I just want you guys to take away dura mater, arachnoid mater, pia mater, and then the vasculature in between the, the pia mater and the dura mater, right? So intracranial bleeding comes in a few different, uh, a, a few different varieties. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about epidural bleeds, subdural bleeds, subarachnoid bleeds, and coning of the brainstem. Now, subdural bleeding, bleeding underneath the dura mater, subarachnoid bleeding, bleeding underneath the arachnoid mater, and uh, epidural bleeding. Um, sorry guys, it's been a couple of years since I looked at these slides and I'm trying to refresh myself as I go here. I didn't get a chance to read all of these before I started tonight. Um, so epidural bleeds are almost universally associated with traumatic mechanisms and skull fractures, uh, almost universally being a, a fairly key point here not universally, right? Um, epidural bleeds, uh, bleeds around the dura, are, uh, are frequently a result of laceration or transection of the middle meningeal artery, as we talked about earlier. 
resulting in the rapid discharge of blood. Now, the middle meningeal artery is not the only artery that can be lacerated, but it's certainly one of the more common ones, um, resulting in the rapid discharge of blood into the epidural space, uh, which leads to herniation of the brainstem, uh, deterioration of the patient, and death. So when we, I don't have a slide to show you guys of this, but if you guys think back to what the brain looks like, and you remember that foramen magnum, the big hole in the bottom of the skull that the, uh, that the brain stem and the spinal cord pass through. So as the brain, if this is my skull here, my mocha skull, um, and we have the foramen magnum in the bottom here, and, uh, and we have a bleed up top, as blood comes in and fills up, the calvarium, the vault of the skull, it starts to fill up and fill up and fill up and fill up. And in the same way, a tension pneumothorax or tension hemothorax puts pressure on the lungs and the heart and squeezes them inside the rib cage. Um, bleeding inside the skull will eventually start to squeeze the brain down and out through that foramen magnum at the bottom, uh, a process called coning because it starts to look like a cone, form like a cone. Um, now, if you guys remember from 20 minutes ago, uh, the structures of the brain that are at the bottom there that are the most directly compressed against the hard bony structures of the skull are the structures of the brain that are responsible for, for base physiologic function, things like breathing, things like gross muscle movement, right? And that gross muscle movement, uh, we'll tie this into uh, to, to Glasgow Coma Scales, well, that gross muscle movement, right? When you guys think about your, um, about your Glasgow Coma Scales, when we start talking about decorticate and decerebrate posturing, that's why those decorticate and decerebrate posturing scales uh, are, are important because it can tell you if that basal or brain function is being impacted, right? Um, epidural bleeds uh, frequently uh, involve a lucid interval of consciousness prior to rapid deterioration of the patient. So people will very often um, be struck in the head somehow possibly lose consciousness, look like or appear to be having potentially a minor concussion, uh, uh, a minor concussion or, or a relatively minor head injury, regain consciousness, and then subsequently deteriorate again and lose consciousness. Uh, I, I certainly, this has been my experience in the field is that this is not an uncommon, uh, not an uncommon occurrence. Um, epidural bleeds, uh, in terms of management, they require, uh, <laughs> the, the wording that's always used in the medical text that I've used here is they require rapid neurosurgical intervention. It is difficult to overemphasize how rapid that neurosurgical intervention needs to be. Um, I'm certainly aware of at least uh, one or two cases where people have actually had burr holes drilled in their skull inside the emergency department without even taking the time to take them upstairs to a, a surgical suite. Not common, but uh, certainly is a thing that has potentially uh, uh, or could potentially end up happening. That's how fast these things can move. Uh, subdural bleeds. Um, subdural bleeds are typically venous um, as opposed to arterial bleeds. They may be chronic. Uh, up to 20% of cases as a result of mild to moderate trauma. So people who receive uh, uh, frequent concussions are prone to subdural bleeds. Other people that are prone to subdural bleeds are the elderly, in particular the elderly on blood thinners. Um, uh, also diabetics and hypertensives. Um, much slower to manifest than epidural bleeds. Uh, so subdural bleeds don't necessarily come on super fast. These are the bleeds that can take, subdural bleeds are the bleeds that can take uh, days or conceivably longer than that to manifest and become obvious. Um, generally speaking, they start as a worsening headache with subsequent neurologic sequelae. Um, up to 20% of subdural hematomas are chronic and non-traumatic. Um, sure, I got this from a reference. I, there's a slide full of sources and references at the end of this. Uh, I, I didn't recall that number prior to, to reading the slide, but sure. Um, this is a great illustration uh, to sort of uh, drive home uh, a little bit of these points here. Um, epidural versus subdural bleeds. The red is an epidural hematoma or arterial bleed, and the blue is the subdural hematoma or the venous bleed. Um, I don't think there's much to say to this slide uh, other than to show it to you guys and sort of uh, point out to you where the dura um, 
where the dura is and where the bleed is relative to the dura. Uh, on the, the arterial bleed, there, there's a skull fracture to sort of demonstrate uh, the, the potential for traumatic injury there as well. Uh, subarachnoid bleeds. Uh, subarachnoid bleeds are bleeds into the cerebrospinal fluid in the subarachnoid space. Subarachnoid bleeds are often characterized by a, by a thunderclap headache, often described as the worst headache of my life. Um, if someone's uh, uh, complaining of the worst headache of my life uh, that, that came on all of a sudden and then they have any type of neurologic sequelae, uh, you should probably just assume that they're having some sort of subarachnoid bleed and transfer them to hospital for someone who, uh, who has access to imaging uh, to try and figure out. Um, there are other things, clearly there are many, many things that cause very, very bad headaches. Um, but uh, people saying, I just, it's just all of a sudden the worst headache of my life, it just came out of nowhere. And now we're all of a sudden seeing other neurologic uh, symptoms uh, indicative of uh, something you should be concerned might be a subarachnoid bleed. Um, subarachnoid bleeds are generally speaking non-traumatic. They could conceivably be traumatic, but uh, they're generally speaking non-traumatic. Um, they are a form of hemorrhagic stroke, of course. Um, brain herniation, we talked about that coning a little bit earlier. Brain herniation or coning results when intracranial pressure, the pressure inside the cranial vault, inside the calvarium, is great enough to begin compressing the brain against structures of the skull and or through the foramen eye. Um, Frequently affects respiratory and motor centers of the brain, resulting in posturing and respiratory abnormalities. So again, that basilar brain stem, those, those, those basic brain functions start to get squeezed down and pushed against the, the basilar skull um, and, and impair the functions uh, that that area of the brain directs, which of course are essential to life. Um, this, is, uh, this shows more lateral uh, brainstem herniation does it? No, no, it doesn't. This shows this shows uh, this shows vertical brainstem herniation. Um, but you can sort of see the idea of of a body of blood uh, increasing its volume inside the calvarium, causing a shift of brain function or pardon me, brain anatomy, um, and forcing uh, herniation through whatever frame. And I happen to be in the wrong uh, in the wrong place. Uh, again, just a reminder of our Glasgow Coma Scale. Um, so the way this was taught to me, I, I struggled to remember the difference between decorticate and decerebrate for years. Um, and I just always get, whatever, it, it's bad. Um, but having some indication of when a patient has changed, if you're reassessing your patient's vital signs, having an assessment of when they change from decorticate to decerebrate posturing can be valuable to the, uh, to the interventional team later on. Uh, decorticate posturing towards the core of the body and decerebrate posturing is the other one, right? Um, odds and ends, we're gonna talk about a few different things. Uh, I think a lot of you guys should be familiar with the concept of a coup contra coup injury. A coup contra coup injury is, is when uh, the, the the whole head stops, or generally speaking, the whole patient stops very suddenly. The brain, of course, is suspended inside the cerebrospinal fluid, inside the cranial vault. Um, the head stops, the skull stops, the brain keeps moving and bangs into the opposite side of the skull. Or conversely, as in this illustration, uh, the baseball bat strikes the patient on the front of the head the skull moves backwards, the skull hits the brain, begins the brain moving, the, the whole head then stops moving backwards, the brain continues moving backwards, and the posterior features of the brain impact the posterior skull as well. It's called a coup contra coup injury, so there's a primary and a secondary impact. Um, battle sign, we often talk about battle sign, this is just a very good photo of what battle sign looks like. Uh, battle sign is, of course, uh, um, uh, the escape of blood through, uh, uh, through some of the foramen eye and pooling behind the ears is an indication of basilar skull fracture, not necessarily through the foramen eye, possibly through basilar skull fracture as well. Battle sign is a, a good indication of uh, a basilar skull fracture or a significant bleed. If you see this in a patient, you should make sure they get put in front of a physician sooner rather than later. Um, Raccoon eyes, we also talk about raccoon eyes. Again, I'm not sure the origins of this image. 
Um, this was something that I found uh, courtesy of Google, I believe. But this is a good example of raccoon eyes. Uh, the raccoon eyes, of course, is the bruising of the skin, um, not the bleeding inside the sclera, but the bruising of the skin around the eyes, the periorbital ecchymosis. Um, if your patient begins smoking from their head, please extinguish them. I have actually had a patient who once set their head on fire. Um, they had extinguished themselves before we got there, though. So in terms of assessment, um, how do we assess this stuff? Well, um, <laughs> our, our dispatcher, David, informs us that there is, there is an NPDS code for that. Uh, there's an NPDS code for everything, Dave. That makes me, uh, that makes me laugh. Um, so assessment of head injuries. We're, we're going to talk about assessment of head injuries. We'll talk about an initial assessment, assessing mechanism, assessing history. Very important in the elderly. Um, assessing a patient's general presentation and doing a neurological assessment. So um, the initial assessment, your primary survey, often the first thing you notice about your patient even before your ABCs is their level of consciousness. You walk into the room and they're slumped over, their eyes are closed. You haven't even gotten around to assessing their airway, their breathing, and their circulation yet, but you can tell they're not conscious, right? Um, we, we often use the AVPU scale, the alert responding to verbal, responding to pain, or unresponsive scale. Uh, normally one of the first assessments that we perform on someone um, as they, uh, um, uh, as we approach them um, or as we come into contact with them, right? So that's our initial assessment. Um, a rapid and thorough, in terms of assessing mechanism and history, mechanism and history are pretty important. We're going to talk, again, moving forward a couple slides about this, but uh, a rapid and thorough understanding of the mechanism of injury is key to assessing head injuries. So we need to understand how much energy uh, was imparted to this person's head, what's the potential for a head injury? If we find an unconscious person beside, uh, uh, beside a ladder, uh, you know, propped up against the side of the house, becomes important to very quickly ascertain was this person walking along the ground, felt chest pain and collapsed to the ground, or did they fall 20 feet from the top of the ladder and land on the ground and hit their head? Um, you know, we don't need all of the details, but we need enough information to make an informed decision quickly about whether, uh, about whether they maybe have a head injury and potentially what kind of, uh, what kind of energy was imparted to their head. Um, if the mechanism is significant enough, uh, a head injury cannot be ruled out in the field. This is really important, guys. Um, as an example, uh, a, a few years back, I cared for some people that had managed to crash their, uh, their automobile at uh, a reported speed they reported to the police that they had crashed their automobile at a speed of, uh, uh, of approximately 200 kilometers an hour. Um, at the time that I met them, those people were all walking, alert, conscious. Uh, you can bet that we treated all of them like they had potential, uh, potential head injury um, and potential C-spine complications simply because the mechanism was so severe. Um, do go back to or think back, you know, 15 slides or so, 10 or 15 slides uh, about some forms of head injury that can have a refractory period, can, you know, people can uh, appear to get better for a period of time before they actively get worse again, right? Um, do remember that some types of head injury can take hours to present clinical signs and symptoms. Uh, I, I would extend this even to, to days in some cases. We do hear about those outlying cases of people that struck their head uh, developed a venous bleed and passed away three days later because they never saw medical attention, right? We don't want to be the people caring for those individuals and then finding out that our patient who we didn't send to hospital passed away several days later from something that would have been detectable had they gone in for a CT scan. Um, a general presentation of a patient uh, can be a very good indication, not always, but can be a very good indication of a critical head injury. So people who are up alert talking, notwithstanding what I just explained in terms of mechanism, but if someone sustained uh, you know, a relatively non-severe mechanism of injury and they look like they're now fine, do we think that they have necessarily an immediately critical or acute head injury? Probably not. They might still need something that, that 
or might still be suffering from something that needs to take them to hospital to be further assessed. But uh, it's not necessarily an indication that they uh, that, that they've uh, suffered an immediately critical injury. Understanding a patient's baseline is pretty essential, especially in elderly patients, and this is this is particularly important in terms of the general presentation as well. Um, we uh, and maybe less so on St. John duties, but we often encounter patients who uh, uh, are elderly patients. Pardon me, who at baseline are neurologically compromised to some extent, either as the result of dementia or other neurodegenerative pathology or from past CVA or stroke or something else. Um, understanding how different Mr. Smith is today after his fall versus how he was today at breakfast six hours ago versus how he was yesterday can take us a long way in understanding how severe the immediate injury might be. As a general rule, um, as a general rule, especially on St. John duties, um, elderly confused people should probably just go to hospital. Um, if you've somehow encountered someone who's uh, elderly and confused uh, on a St. John duty, you should probably just call the professionals and let that person be assessed by, uh, by a pre-hospital healthcare professional um, and take them to the hospital for a physician to see them as well. Um, neurological assessments. I, I think most of this should be familiar to everyone. Um, the FAST van assessment is, uh, I think this is more of a BC thing. So for our friends in Ontario and Alberta, um, this might not be super familiar for you. This is how, uh, how we locally uh, have chosen to uh, mnemonicize, make a mnemonic out of the Cincinnati Stroke Assessment Scale, it's the same thing. Uh, this is the Cincinnati Stroke Assessment Scale. Uh, face, arm, speech, and time. So again, is that, you know, uh, this is your standard stroke assessment. Um, you know, look for facial droop, have someone present their arms or the palms up and hold them for 10 seconds with their eyes closed. Do they have slurred or altered speech? What time was the onset of symptoms? Uh, do they have changes in vision? Do they have aphasia? Do they have neglect? What are their pupils doing? Are their pupils equal and reactive or something different? And what is their Glasgow Coma Scale? Um, the reason we do this stuff, some of the, you know, these neurological assessments, particularly fast fan, um, can be useful in some types of head injuries, not necessarily all of them. Diffuse concussions are probably not going to have uh, not going to have a huge amount of benefit from a, a fast van assessment. Having said that, fast van can help locate specific regions of the brain that might have been affected potentially. Um, it takes you 20 seconds, just do it on someone who's got a head injury. Um, pupillary response, we talked about pupillary response. We always see, it's fantastic in movies because you always see the medic shining the, the flashlight into the patient's eyes. Um, we wanna know for pupils, are the pupils equal? Are they inappropriately dilated or pinned or dilated or constricted? Are they reactive to light? Is that reactivity equal on both sides? It, is, it, uh, is the reactivity sluggish, non-responsive, reacting at a normal fast speed? Um, yeah. Unequal pupils are generally speaking a late sign of brain injury as are sluggish pupils. There are other things that can cause unreactive pupils. There are other things that can cause sluggish pupils, but in the context of a head injury, and someone who we think their primary problem is a head injury, unequal pupils are generally one of the later things that we see. They're normally a very bad sign. They're not uh, diagnostically um, optimistic uh, for a positive prognosis for a patient. Um, having said that, it is important to remember, some people have slightly or wildly unequal pupils. Some people have glass eyes. Um, I have not yet done this myself, but I do know of at least one person who has shone a light into an eye and diligently reported that the left eye was uh, non-reactive to light when in fact the left eye was a prosthetic. Um, ha ha ha, it's great for a laugh afterwards, but don't forget that. Um, it's important to remember as well that again, with pupils being a fairly late sign of brain injury, um, when we say late sign, we're talking about like, you know, um, 
when we're seeing basilar function, uh, basilar brain function impact, we're talking about coning and herniation through the frame magnum or into, into the inferior uh, uh, features of the skull. Um, someone who had a minor bump on the head, maybe lost consciousness for five minutes, has now regained consciousness and happens to have one pupil that's one millimeter wider than the other, this is not a sign of a latent major brain injury. This is probably someone who has one pupil that's a bit larger than the other. In the absence of other clinical indicators, um, pupillary response is, is of less benefit, but in terms of someone who sustained a severe head injury, uh, this, can be, uh, this can be a useful sign to note. The Glasgow Coma Scale, um, I recently learned, fun fact, I recently learned from uh, a licensed practical nurse who I interacted with here in Victoria that the Glasgow Coma Scale is not in fact taught to licensed practical nurses. So if you're talking to an LPN, um, if you're talking to an LPN and they don't know what GCS means, uh, that's why apparently it's not covered in their curriculum before they get their LPN uh, qualification here in BC at least. Um, the Glasgow Coma Scale has been in use since 1974. It was, as you might guess, developed at the University of Glasgow by gentlemen in Graham Teasdale, or gentlemen in uh, Brian, Graham Teasdale and Brian Tennant. Um, the GCS, the Glasgow Coma Scale, is an objective way to describe a level of consciousness. So what it does is it lets us codify very specific uh, physiologic or uh, um, well, very, very specific physiologic features into a very discrete scale that is difficult to misinterpret, but not impossible, not impossible. Uh, there's a running, uh, running joke in pre-hospital care that even a corpse gets a GCS of three. Um, the takeaway from that is that, uh, you know, anything less than a GCS of 15 uh, should be regarded with some degree of suspicion uh, in the sense that you should be trying to figure out why your patient has a GCS of less than 15, right? So I think, we got, I think this should be familiar to all of us, but just a quick reminder, uh, the GCS, the Glasgow Coma Scale, uh, a, a full response is a four, five, six. Someone who spontaneously opens their eyes is oriented to person, place, time, situation, and obeys commands, right? Um, this Glasgow Coma Scale is slightly more detailed than the, the, the quick reference ones that you might see on, on PCRs, either electronic or paper-based. Um, a few things a few things that are important that I think uh, I don't see emphasized enough, uh, uh, certainly on our own physical paper paperwork here, and certainly in the electronic software that I use at work. Um, you know, the, the eye response is pretty straightforward. They spontaneously open the open to verbal command, speech, or shout, right? Hey, right? Oh. Um, they open pain stimuli, they don't open no response. That's fairly clear cut. Oriented is fairly clear cut. Uh, a verbal response of confused conversation, but able to answer questions, right? Uh, as opposed to inappropriate responses, but words are discernible. That's not necessarily the exact way that this is presented to everyone. I believe this does actually come from the University of Glasgow. This is what the Glasgow Coma Scale is supposed to be, right? Um, incomprehensible speech, so incomprehensible noises. You're making noises with your voice box and your windpipe, um, but they are incomprehensible or no verbal response whatsoever. And then a motor response of obeys commands or purposeful movement to pain stimulus. Purposeful movement is key, purposeful, right? Withdrawing from pain, and then of course, decorticate and decerebral posturing. Uh, so what do we do? This is this is the fastest uh, portion of this. We're almost done, guys. Hang out, hang with me. Um, this is the fastest portion of this uh, of this slide here. But um, what do we do with head injuries when we see them on a St. John duty in public uh, when we're at work doing whatever we do for work, right? Well, recognition, early recognition of a head injury or the fact that someone has a potential head injury is pretty important. The mechanism and your AVPU scale will probably help you pick up on 90, 95% of head injuries that you're going to encounter. Should be fairly obvious from the mechanism and the AVPU scale when you first meet your patient, right? Um, in some cases, symptoms might not present for a period of time or they might be subtle. So people with short-term memory loss may, may take some time conversing with the patient for it to become obvious. 
some people with venous bleeds might take a long time uh, to, to present with any symptoms and then deteriorate after that point in time, which is why anyone who's got a potential head injury based on mechanism should probably be seen by a physician to get a sign off on that. Um, I don't think I talked about this earlier, but I, I, I wanna just really briefly um, comment on mechanism. Um, it's important to remember that mechanism for someone like myself, I'm a 38 year old relatively healthy male, um, a significant mechanism for me might be a catastrophic mechanism for a 100 year old on blood thinners. Something that could be a, a catastrophic mechanism for a 100 year old on blood thinners uh, might be trivial or unremarkable to me, right? So just remember the frailty of an individual and their, their degree of osteological compromise I think we talked about this a little bit earlier, but their degree of osteological compromise goes a long way into uh, uh, describing or predicting how badly injured they might be by a particular traumatic mechanism. So what do we do for these guys? This is really straightforward. Manage the ABCs, manage their, manage their breathing, manage the circulation, perform spinal mobilization, perfect spinal mobilization, uh, doesn't help a patient who does not have an airway or is not breathing. Right, so we want to do spinal mobilization or spinal motion restriction is how we talk about this now. Um, but manage your ABCs first, right? ABCs first with C spine management if appropriate. Right, uh, it's important to note that some severe hand, head injuries, um, particularly uh, epidural bleeds, uh, can result in. I don't think we talked about this earlier as well, guys. I'm sorry. Um, but can result in uh, significant airway challenges in terms of projectile vomiting and large quantities of emesis. So head injuries are known for causing people to throw up and vomit. And if you've got someone C-spined onto a longboard, you should be predicting and assuming that they will throw up while they're in that position and have a plan to manage that airway, whether that's with suction, whether that's with a roll, whatever you have at your, uh, at your disposal. Um, spinal immobilization or spinal motion restriction. C-spine uh, immobilization is often but not always appropriate for a head injured patient. Uh, I say often but not always because there are circumstances in which someone might have suffered a, a really isolated blow to the head uh, and not necessarily uh, not necessarily need to have, uh, have their neck uh, motion restricted or immobilized. Um, head injuries do frequently involve significant mechanism, which may also cause damage to cervical vertebrae, uh, frequently, but not always. Again, reasonable judgment, best judgment. If in doubt, put a collar on them, right? Uh, you're unlikely to cause significant harm with a collar. If in doubt, put a collar on them. Uh, combative patients may cause more harm to themselves if they're restrained on a board. Uh, if you have a combative head injured patient, I don't know what to tell you except to do the best you can. Call for more help. Uh, if you have capacity to call for uh, someone who can perform a sedation, uh, that, that would be a reasonable thing if someone's really fighting you and they're head injured. Um, ABCs still and always take priority, right? Airway breathing, circulation, airway breathing, circulation. Um, that's all I got for you guys. Oops. We have uh, a slide full of references that I'm gonna leave up here for a second. And uh, this is a whole whack of this stuff came from my, uh, from my uh, course notes at UVic as well, many moons ago. Um, does anyone have any questions? Anyone? Bueller, Bueller. Uh, Uh, Jeff Kopp says, please do not apply a cervical collar tightly. Restrictions of venous return and drainage can increase ICP by 10 to 20 millimeters uh, um, of, uh, I believe that's supposed to be millimeters of mercury. Um, <laughs> I, uh, yes, that's a very good point. Over tightening of, uh, of uh, spinal motion restriction can be significantly detrimental to your patient. Please apply your collars as you have been taught and don't over tighten them 
Um, Mike says, great review, Nick. A lot of made her to absorb. Um, <laughs> um, Jeff's also noting, uh, please incline the head of the bed 20 to 30 degrees to improve drainage uh, and maintain peep. I, yes and no, Jeff. Um, with, with the St. John world, we're still unfortunately uh, putting everyone onto a clamshell and keeping them supine for the most part. Uh, though I guess you could incline the head of the bed and have them, you know, have their entire climb shell uh, inclined by 20 to 30 degrees. Um, for the folks saying thank you, you guys are welcome. Uh, if anyone has specific questions, I'm more than happy to take some time to answer them. I know there's a lot of content in here. Um, quite a lot of content in here. This is a, a pretty information dense uh, hour and a half or so. Um, oh, I see from Nicole, the 1053, uh, a DII is a diffuse axonal injury, DAI diffuse axonal injury. So it's a, a broad injury of the axons, which are the, uh, the, the extensions of neurons in the brain. Uh, Jeff notes uh, that TBI are very sensitive to hypoxia and hypotension. Um, that's a very good point, Jeff. We didn't talk about this much tonight. But uh, tra traumatic brain injuries and you know really most traumas in general, uh, throwing some oxygen on your patient or even providing it by mask uh, instead of just throwing it at them uh, is probably a good idea. There's uh, very few cases I can think of where trauma patients don't benefit from uh, from uh, from supplemental oxygen. 